welcome to the Pulse Report. I'm Dr. Shen, a cardiologist specializing in electrophysiology and the director of research and education at Cardiovascular Medicine. Welcome to today's Your Questions Answered. One of the questions I hear most often is, if I have an ablation, does it cure my atrial fibrillation forever? That's a fair question, and it matters because the answer helps you and your loved ones know what to expect and decide what care feels right. So in this episode, I'll walk you through what ablation does, what it doesn't do, and what the research published in top journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association, Circulation, and the New England Journal of Medicine tell us how well it works. Let's start with the basics. What exactly is ablation, and why does it matter for people with AFib? If you have atrial fibrillation or AFib, one of the main treatment options for you is ablation. It's a minimally invasive procedure where we guide thin catheters through the veins into your heart. Using energy, heat, cold, or newer pulse electric fields, we treat small areas that trigger your irregular rhythm. So why does that matter? Well, in AFib, the upper chambers of your heart quiver instead of beating in a steady, organized way. You might feel this as a racing heartbeat, being unusually tired, shortness of breath, or dizziness. If AFib isn't treated, it doesn't just cause uncomfortable symptoms. It can raise your risk of stroke three to five times higher and make you three to nine times more likely to develop heart failure, depending on your age, sex, and overall health. The reason AFib causes both the symptoms you feel and the risks over time comes down to your heart's electrical system. Normally, those signals act like wiring that keeps everything in rhythm, but in AFib, that wiring misfires. Tiny areas in your heart, often near the pulmonary veins, start sending out abnormal signals that throw your rhythm off. That's exactly where ablation helps. We go straight to those areas that are misfiring and neutralize them so they can't cause trouble anymore. By shutting down those faulty signals, ablation helps restore a steadier rhythm. I often compare it to fixing the wiring in a house. When the wiring sparks or shorts, the lights flicker. Once we repair it, the lights shine steadily again. And with ablation, we don't rewire the whole system. We just shut off the tiny switches that are misfiring so the rest of your heart's electrical flow runs smoothly. Now that we've talked about what ablation is and how it works, let's get to the big question. Can it cure AFib for good? Here's the honest answer. Ablation often provides long-term relief, but it isn't always a permanent cure. Let's take a closer look at what the research shows. One of the biggest studies we have is called the Cabana Trial. It followed more than 2,000 people and was published in major journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association. It showed that ablation reduced AFib recurrence and improved quality of life compared to medications. In other words, ablation helped people have fewer AFib episodes and feel better overall compared to medications. But it wasn't perfect. Some people still had AFib come back, and not everyone was able to stop their medications completely. Other important studies, like Early AF and Stop AF First, published in the New England Journal of Medicine and Circulation, looked at ablation when it was done early. They showed that ablation worked better than medications at keeping people in rhythm. But even then, about 15 to 25% of patients had AFib return within the first year. That is to say, while ablation worked better, about one in four patients had their AFib come back within the first year. So as these studies show, ablation is a powerful tool, but I often describe it as disease control rather than a once and for all cure. Why? Let's go back to that house wiring image. We can shut down the wires that are sparking, but sometimes new faulty connections form or the old shorts reconnect. The same thing can happen in your heart. Ablation can silence the misfiring cells, but over time, new triggers can form or old ones can come back to life. That means AFib can return and sometimes a repeat procedure or medications are still needed. And this distinction is important. If we expect a forever cure, it can feel discouraging if AFib comes back. But if we see ablation as a way to greatly reduce symptoms, cut down hospital visits, and improve quality of life, then expectations match reality better. 
and I've seen that difference firsthand. Patients often tell me after ablation, "I can finally walk up the stairs without feeling winded," or "I have the energy to play with my grandkids again." That's the kind of change that really matters. The research echoes those experiences. Studies published in Heart Rhythm and the Journal of the American Medical Association show that successful ablation doesn't just ease symptoms; it may also lower the risk of heart failure progression and even reduce strokes. And more recent findings remind us that ablation works best when combined with healthy habits like treating sleep apnea, keeping blood pressure under control, exercising. And maintaining a healthy weight. Together, these steps can cut your AFib burden by more than 99 percent. For example, if before treatment your heart was in AFib 10 hours a week, a more than 99 percent reduction means you might only have a few minutes or even seconds of AFib over that same time. In short, it doesn't necessarily mean AFib is 100 percent gone forever, but it does mean your heart is spending virtually all of its time in a normal rhythm. Think of it this way: ablation can reset the heart's rhythm, but lifestyle changes are what keep the rhythm steady over time. So, if ablation can lay the foundation and lifestyle can build the structure around it, the next question is, who is right for it? Ablation is not for everyone. Some people do very well with medications alone. For example, I've cared for people who only have rare episodes of atrial fibrillation, maybe once or twice a year. In those situations. A daily pill to control rhythm or rate works well, and there is no need for a procedure right away. Others may not be good candidates for ablation because of other health conditions. Someone who has severe lung disease, advanced kidney failure, or significant frailty may face higher risk from anesthesia or catheter procedures. For them, the safer and more realistic option may be medication, careful monitoring, and focusing on quality of life. Personal preference also matters. I've had some elderly and frail patients share with me, "Doctor, I know ablation could help, but I don't want to go through a procedure. I'd rather manage with medications." That is a perfectly reasonable choice. On the other hand, younger patients who are still working or raising families often say, "I don't want to feel this tired anymore. I want a more active life." For them, ablation may be the foundation that helps them rebuild a more energetic daily routine. And what I see in my clinic isn't just anecdotal. The research tells the same story. The Cabana trial, one of the largest studies we have, really shows why these decisions vary so much from person to person. Let me break down why. First, different outcomes matter to different people. In Cabana, ablation clearly helped people feel better. Patients reported fewer palpitations, less fatigue, and better quality of life. But when it came to living longer, Or avoiding major events like strokes or heart attacks, ablation didn't show a big difference compared to medications. If your top priority is day-to-day -day relief, ablation delivers. But if your main concern is survival, the evidence doesn't show ablation gives an overall advantage. Second, patient preferences differ. Cabana found that more than a quarter of patients who started on medication ended up crossing over to ablation within five years. Why? Because many still struggle with symptoms or side effects from the drugs, some people are fine taking a pill every day, but others would rather have a procedure if it means fewer AFib episodes and less disruption to daily life. Third, patients themselves are not all the same. Cabana included people of different ages and with different types of AFib. The results suggested that younger patients or those with fewer other health problems. May get more benefit in terms of symptom relief and fewer hospital visits, but for older patients with more advanced conditions, meaning things like long-standing AFib, heart failure, or multiple other medical issues, the difference between ablation and medications was smaller. Taken together, the evidence makes one thing clear: ablation isn't one size fits all. The Cabana trial shows us that ablation can be life-changing for some. But not everyone needs it or wants it. That's why the decision really depends on your own priorities. Do you care most about feeling better day to day, avoiding medications, or steering clear of procedures? Your answer to that shapes the right choice for you, and that matters because the goal isn't just to choose ablation or medication. 
is to match the treatment to you in a way that supports the outcomes that matter most in your life. Some people want to minimize side effects from daily pills. Others prefer to avoid procedures altogether. And for many, the ultimate goal is simple: having enough energy to enjoy time with family, play with grandchildren, travel, or just do the activities that bring joy. So, does ablation cure AFib permanently? Not always, but it is one of the most effective tool we have to reduce AFib burden, restore rhythm, and improve daily life. The evidence from top trials shows that ablation outperforms medications in reducing recurrence and improving symptoms. Still, AFib can come back. That's why ongoing care, lifestyle changes, and shared decision making are so important. The bottom line is this: ablation is an important option, but the decision is personal. It depends on your goals, your life, and your loved ones. When it comes to ablation, think of it this way: it can give you the foundation, a reset, but it's the structure you build on top with daily habits and medical follow-up that keeps everything steady and strong over time. If you found this episode useful, please share it with a friend or loved one who might benefit. And if you've got more questions, drop them in the comments. I'll answer them in future episodes. Don't forget to subscribe for clear answers to your heart health questions. Thank you for listening to the Pulse Report. I'm Dr. Shen, and let's keep your heart and your life going strong and in rhythm.